This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening to Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Today, I am talking to Myra McDonald, who has written uh, several books, which uh, I think are quite relevant to what's going on in the world right now, uh, and which is why I reached out to her. Uh, I follow her on Twitter, and uh, she's pretty incisive on topics related to the Indian subcontinent and uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan region. So uh, she is the author of Defeat is an Orphan, How Pakistan Lost a Great South Asian War, which uh, I'm not sure if I would agree with the title anymore. We'll see. Um, and then White as the Shroud, India, Pakistan, and War on the Frontiers of Kashmir. And just just for the listeners, I mean, I know most of you probably are are pretty well situated with geography, but um, you know, Kashmir is in the very northern part of the subcontinent. It's like just a little bit east, kind of of, of Afghanistan, which is on the other side of Pakistan. So everything is kind of crunched together here at the uh, roof of the world, so to speak, where you have Tibet, Kashmir, Central Asia, Afghanistan, northern Pakistan, and um, you know, uh, the the historical context of this actually goes back really far, at least in terms of modern politics, with the great game between the Russians and the British. So um, there's just so much to say. But um, I want to really focus on what happened recently in Afghanistan, what is happening, uh, the turn that it's taken in 2021, and um, how that relates to the past generation or two of geopolitics, which most Americans, to be frank, have just not been paying attention to, Myra. Okay, hi. Um, well, let me start by introducing myself very quickly. Um, I worked for Reuters, um, or Reuters, I think you call it in the States, for, for nearly 30 years. Um, I arrived in India in 2000, uh, expecting to cover the rising economy, but very quickly got hit. I was the bureau chief of Reuters, but very quickly got hit, hit by 9-11. India and Pakistan nearly went to war. Um, and I have since then pretty much focused on India, Pakistan, Kashmir. I've covered Afghanistan only in as much as it's affected the India-Pakistan story. So I wouldn't consider myself to be an Afghan expert, but I did cover it in detail for a while. Um, and I also got involved for a while in covering Taliban talks um, quite a few years ago when they first took off. Um, I don't know if you want to jump straight into Afghanistan, but maybe I could say, just in a way to preface this, is this is quite hard for all of us who've followed the subject for a very long time, um, because you start feeling there is nothing new to say. Um, I think I was asked to write my first story on Afghanistan a couple of days after 9-11, when they asked me to write um, a history of failed interventions in Afghanistan. And um, and obviously, I talked about the British experience of Afghanistan, the Soviet Union's experience of Afghanistan. It's it's in some ways fortunate for me not available online anymore because I used all those cliches like graveyard of empires, which I noticed even President Biden used last night, uh, which really after 20 years we should have grown out of. Um, but I think, I mean, in terms of the the big context for me is that during the first Obama presidency in particular, um, I and lots of other people went through every single detail for how the situation in Afghanistan might be solved. Um, there was huge amounts of debate, of commentary, um, and I really had the impression by about 2011 at the very latest that the Americans had tried everything by then. And after that, it was simply trading water, partly for sunk cost reasons. And and certainly when I heard uh, President Biden speak last night, I thought he could have said that 10 years ago and it would have also stood true. So that's kind of big picture. Um, I'm yeah, sure so, uh, I'm Myra, let me just, yeah, let me just say, you know, as an American, you know, we've... Um, 
you know, seeing this stuff happen with 9-11, the invasion of Afghanistan, the invasion of Iraq. And uh, one thing that I think a lot of us feel is deja vu uh, insofar as just the same arguments are cropping up again. And it's just it's really bizarre. And I do remember um, one thing that's really striking to me. And I, I want you to talk about Pakistan a little bit in the bigger geopolitical context, because uh, a lot of the people that I follow on our online are Indian and some of them are Pakistanis. And they're just talking about things I don't really understand um, in terms of intelligence agencies and all these things that I, and if I don't understand it, I'm going to tell you most Americans have no idea what's going on. So um, first of all, it's interesting to me. I remember when we came into Afghanistan, we as an America in 2001 and 2002, I remember specifically some Pakistani commentators were saying, you know, let's be honest, you guys are going to leave and we're going to be here. So we're just going to wait because ultimately you're not in it for the long haul. And, you know, I don't remember. I don't think I, I thought, yeah, probably that's true. But, um, you know, we'll probably put in like a I don't I don't know what we thought. I thought we would put in like. Um, but in any case, that's, that's that's kind of what happened from my percep perception. They just waited us out. Pakistan just waited us out. It, it took 20 years. That's a long time. I think that's longer than they thought, but longer than we thought, too. But ultimately, um, that worked. And I remember people were talking about how, well, you know, ultimately, the Pashtuns, they don't. Uh, you know, they'll resist and they're they're hardy fighters. And, you know, we just kind of like rolled over Afghanistan very quickly and we suppressed it for, you know, two decades with our drones and our technology. But ultimately, they're back. I mean, the Taliban are back uh, just like they were. I mean, most of these guys don't remember the last time the Taliban was even in power. They're so young. But uh, the whole thing is very, very deja vu. Could you talk about like your books and in terms of like what their general conclusions are and just the whole context of South Asia and this region around Afghanistan. Right. Okay. So let's try and do divide it into um, segments. So I guess there's the pre the, the British period um, pre 1947 Afghanistan was never um, obviously controlled by the British Um not because of anything sort of inherent in the Afghan national character, but because it simply didn't lend itself easily to empire building. Whereas actually what was then United India was easier to run by co-opting an urbanized elite over the subcontinent. Um, then what happened is that, now stop me if ever I, if I start being overly simplistic or overly complicated, but I think we then look at... So let's start with the big picture. You've got India and Pakistan reasonably well run, whatever you think about empire, with a, a massive bureaucracy run by the British. And then you've got Afghanistan, which was never urbanized in the same way or developed in the same way. Um, and you then come to 1947 and independence of India and the partition of the Indian subcontinent into India and Pakistan. Um, and really, without going back to that 1947 thing, you're probably never going to completely grasp the nature of Pakistan's involvement in Afghanistan. Um, now, first of all, Afghanistan refused to recognize Pakistan at the outset um, in 1947. It continues to refuse to recognize the border between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So Pakistan has always tried consistently to keep Afghanistan unstable, off balance, um, and generally the weaker, the weaker of the two neighbors between Pakistan and India. Sorry, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, then, if you look at Pakistan and India, um, you have the problem of Pakistan being a very insecure state right from the outset. Um, and as you obviously know, um, split between East Pakistan, West Pakistan, between a much stronger, um, more stable India. So Pakistan has been obsessed with believing itself to face a security threat from India pretty much since the beginning. And that sense of security threat is multiplied in Afghanistan because if India has a friendly relationship with Afghanistan, Pakistan believes, I don't believe it's handled it right, but Pakistan believes that it is threatened on two fronts, that it is encircled by both Afghanistan and India. Um, and perhaps the most striking thing is, 
for those of you who know that India and Pakistan started their for their new independent lives at war in, after 1947. It's worth bearing in mind that had India won control of all of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which has been the main bone of contention um, since the beginning, um, India would have had a corridor all the way through Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, through to Afghanistan. It seems to me reasonably unlikely that Pakistan would have survived in that um, in that situation. So this notion of feeling threatened by Afghanistan as a subset of its bigger uh, fear or dislike of India um, is, is kind of ingrained into its DNA. Um, now, Pakistan, to my mind, has then chosen absolutely the wrong way to go about it. It has relied on Islamist militant proxies to exert its influence in Afghanistan um, and to the point where it actually really had no friends in Afghanistan other than those Islamist proxies, uh, whether those be um, militant groups or indeed the Taliban that it, it, it nurtured to take over power in Afghanistan in 1996. Um, so Essentially, that could never really be solved, or, or at least the Obama administration came in arguing this. Um, it, it would only be solved if Pakistan became a more comfortable state, at ease with itself, um, a more stable democracy, and at peace with India. And, and until you got that to happen, you were always going to be stuck with Pakistan interfering in Afghanistan and basically keeping it off balance because they were never going to allow a strong and stable Afghanistan on their doorstep that was friendly with India. Um, okay, go on. Well, I mean, I guess my question is, well, what about a strong and stable Afghanistan that's friendly with Pakistan? They'd be okay with that, right? Yeah, but they got themselves into a position that, that they didn't have leverage through anyone other than the Islamist groups. Um, and that's to some extent a legacy of the uh the the anti-soviet jihad um following the, the the soviet occupation of afghanistan in 1979 um yes it was heavily bankrolled by the united states and saudi arabia but pakistan very definitely chose or influenced the fact that that jihad or the the opposition to the soviet occupation would be carried out by islamist groups because it always believed it could control if islamist groups more effectively um, a strong and stable Afghanistan that is nationalist, on the, on, on the other hand, is a strong and stable Afghanistan that would, would press its claims on parts of Pakistan, on what is now the Pakistan side of the border. So I don't believe that it ever wants a strong ethnic nationalist Afghanistan. Okay, um, I, see, I, I see what you're saying. So I think uh, the issue that I wasn't entirely clear on is how seriously... The issues related to um, the map, the old maps and the borders are and that they're persistent and structural. Is that is that my under, am I understanding this correctly? Um, Pakistan believes them to be persistent and structural. Um, they probably are not so much anymore in the sense that all the, the Pashtuns living on the Pakistan side of the border have, have by and large uh, adapted to becoming part of Pakistan. Um, so you do have a bit of a legacy problem is that, pa is that in theory, Pakistan could accept a strong and stable Afghanistan right now, but Afghanistan is never going to trust it because Pakistan's main leverage has historically been through Islamist groups. Mm -hmm. Well, so what is the, um, what is your understanding, I guess? Cause you know, I mean, everyone, well, not everyone, but most people know, okay, so there's a Taliban in Pakistan, there's a Taliban in Afghanistan, the border is pretty porous, and they've given Pakistan has given refuge to the Taliban. Um, I hear things about, um, I think that the ISI, the Pakistani intelligence, have a connection to the Taliban. I mean, could you help unpack uh, unpack all of this stuff for us uh, here in the states? Where, I mean, look, we're not that great at geography, so um, it's easy for us to get lost. Uh, okay, so basically, I, I, again, I probably need to go back to the the um, anti-Soviet jihad was run. Um, from the from northwest Pakistan, so from what were known as the tribal areas of Pakistan, um, they were based in in northwest Pakistan, and uh, it 
I mean, to some extent, it, it industrialized the jihad. Um, Pakistan would have used Islamists to exert its influence in Afghanistan anyway. But it's certainly true that that huge influx of American and Saudi money industrialized it to the point that not only did the Islamist cause become much more powerful, um, but within Pakistan, um, the then dictator, uh, Zul Haq, uh, was able to Islamicize Pakistan much more effectively. And on top of that, the Pakistan Intelligence Agency, the Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, um, became much, much more powerful because they, were, they, they, they became the organization that was running a massive proxy war against the Soviet Union. Uh, the ISI has not lost those skills. Um, and some of you will remember the time when I think it was Admiral Mike Mullen called the Taliban the veritable arm of the ISI, or either the Taliban or the Haqqani Network, which is another of the Islamist groups. They have never lost their capacity to organize covert warfare in Afghanistan um, and clearly manage it extremely well in the sense that they get away with saying publicly that they don't support the Taliban while privately providing um, a level of logistical support. Um, now, I, I'm, I think it's difficult to say for sure how much support they give the, the Afghan Taliban. Um, uh, the Afghan Taliban certainly have sanctuary in Pakistan. Um, and we're not just talking the, the fringes of Pakistan. You're talking about right into the main cities, uh, you know, uh, Peshawar, um, Quetta. I think Mala Omar, the former Afghan Taliban leader, died in hospital in Karachi, if I remember rightly. So you're talking about uh, the leadership being being proper and their families being properly settled within mainland Pakistan. Um, the idea that which the Pakistanis put about for a while that they just crept over the borders into sort of the wilder fringes and Pakistan couldn't manage it is, is certainly not true. Um, having said that, it would certainly be fair to say they do not exert 100% control over the Afghan Taliban. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd be really reluctant to put a percentage on it. And maybe, I mean, certainly now it'll be less because the Afghan Taliban have got their own base in Afghanistan right now. Um, but, and they did also always face a difficulty, and that comes to the point you made, is that having not trusted the Americans to stay, um, then they were never going to turn fully on the Afghan Taliban because they didn't want to be the ones that were then facing the backlash when the Americans left. Um, I would, however, slightly quibble with your, your comment in the opening remarks when you said that, uh, you know, Pakistan said right from the beginning, around 2001, 2002, they didn't believe the Americans were going to stay. Um, I think that was... I mean, that was a, an element of it, but I think that provided useful cover for the fact that they were never going to turn on the Afghan Taliban anyway in the first place. Yeah, I mean, so I guess a, a question that I have, and I don't know like, what your insight on this is. So they, uh, the Pakistan supported the Mujahideen, the United States supported the Mujahideen uh, in the 1980s and, you know, well, basically in the 80s during the Reagan era. It was a big deal, um, you know. It was big in the media, and it was a cost to lab in Congress. Uh, some of those Mujahideen later became the Northern Alliance. And so, and the Northern Alliance is the anti-Taliban group that pretty much took over after 2001, and the remnants of that, are, I guess, are going to be the resistance. Uh, apparently, there is a, a declaration of some secession in Panjshir Valley in the north uh, east of the country, the usual stuff. So I guess my question is, did Pakistan turn away from those allies and to the Taliban later? Like, how did it become that the 1980s Mujahideen uh, became the moderates that India and the United States and the non-Pakistan sides back? I mean, was there an evolution there? Did something happen in terms of geopolitical events? Um, I think what mainly happened was... no. Um, now let's be clear that the, the decision Pakistan always had the, 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 by far the largest share of the influence in deciding which groups were going to be supported during the anti-Soviet jihad um, and 
then with the withdrawal of the Soviet Union, uh, then um, in 1989, um, you then saw the whole thing kind of collapsing a little bit into, into factionalism. Um, and then when the Soviet Union collapsed altogether uh, and withdrew its funding from, well, there was no uh, Russian money coming anymore to the government in Kabul, the government then collapsed. And you saw from uh, from 1992 onwards a truly brutal, ugly, ugly civil war in Afghanistan that uh, to some extent we should be relieved that we're not seeing a repeat of, um, because the, the, the casualties and the chaos and the violence was horrendous. At that point, and people argue um, different ways about this, at, at that point, some of the people, most of them were too young to have really been part of the anti-Soviet jihad. Um, the so-called Taliban, um, who, depending who you believed, either emerged spontaneously in around 1994 um, in Kandahar or were um, put together by the ISI in Kandahar and dressed up as, as a spontaneous movement, then kind of came to the fore to to start saying, look, we've had enough of this, this ridiculous factional violence um, and we're going to start creating stability. Um, clearly backed by Pakistan um, and uh, were then able to, with, with massive support from Pakistan, were then able to first rise to prominence and then eventually take over Kabul in 1996. Um, and as you know, they were there from 1996 to 2001 in charge. So yeah, I mean, the big, the big, big change was, I guess, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, but the it, that whole thing was exacerbated by a descent into factionalism. And I mean, we certainly shouldn't believe that all Islamist groups are united any more than we would ever have believed that all Christian fundamentalist groups were united when Europe fought its wars um i mean they're 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 and they're not just it's not just defined by by religion anyway i mean there's huge ethnic divides but there's also personal divides and personal ambition so mm. pakistan to some extent and i think probably as ever one thing i've noticed in all my books i've done on pakistan is they tend to do a lot of overreach so um they kind of pushed Afghanistan, pushed the Taliban into Afghanistan. They never 100% controlled it when the Taliban were in charge from 1996 to 2001. Uh, I think the other thing that's, so, so two other things were going on before the Americans came in, in in 2001 was, first of all, the Taliban in charge, but they didn't have full charge of the country. As you mentioned, the old Northern Alliance was still quite powerful then. Um, because the Taliban didn't have full charge of the country, it suited it to rely on groups like Al Qaeda to provide that extra fighting force. Um, and this is an important reason, it's an important thing to bear in mind when you think, why did they not throw Al Qaeda out sooner? Um, part of it was that they were they were weak enough to be dependent on Al Qaeda and various other groups. Uh, mm. The um, and just to be clear, for those who aren't, while well, Pakistan supported the Taliban in, in, in Afghanistan, the Northern Alliance was supported by India and Iran. So uh, the other side, the other thing that's very important to bear in mind is that in the run up to 2001, um, Afghanistan was very useful uh, for Pakistan uh, for providing training camps for militants that Pakistan was using to fight in Kashmir. Uh, because there was no real international access to Afghanistan, then uh, Pakistan was able to train militants using the skills it had learned during the anti-Soviet jihad, train those militants up and send them into Kashmir when the anti-India separatist insurgency in Kashmir was at its height. So you you saw a lot of stuff happening around then in Kashmir, oh, suicide bombings um, and so on. Um, 
that really was a spillover from from uh, uh, from Afghanistan. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess like that's one of the reasons I reached out to you because I'm hearing people on social media, um, Indians, talk about you know the consequences for Kashmir and you know just how Pakistan has you know the upper hand, and so there's obviously their perception is there's there's bigger geopolitical. Uh, implications now i I do want to say um you know i think like your book uh, defeat is an orphan uh basically um i think it seems to argue that strategically pakistan was wrong-footed in the last generation last generation and you know let me just say economically uh, i just uh checked it before we got on the podcast um you know my family's from bangladesh uh as most listeners know um there's a war of independence 1971 against pakistan west pakistan and Bangladesh was like a basket case, really poor nation. Now it has a higher GDP per capita than Pakistan. Uh, and Pakistan is just, it is of the big three uh, South Asian nations. It's the one with the least economic resources now in many ways. Whereas, you know, um, in the late 1990s, it wasn't like that. Pakistan was actually, uh, even if its aggregate GDP was lower than India, it was on a per, per unit basis. Uh, a richer country than India, and by, it was a far richer country than than Bangladesh. And so here we are in 2021. A lot of Pakistanis I know are, um, you know, they're mildly happy. I mean, I think most of them know that the Taliban is uh, that's a dangerous game to be playing, but they feel like they've gotten a strategic victory here. But it's 2021. Pakistan is economically kind of a basket case that um, is relying on China and the um, international financial institutions to keep it. Afloat. Um, so my question is, in light of the changed situations in a generation where Pakistan's trajectory uh, in macroeconomic uh, sense is just not very good, not very healthy, um, what are they doing playing these geopolitical games and are they going to be able to sustain them? Um, OK, so quite a lot to unpack there. Um, but I mean, yeah, absolutely reinforce your point. I mean, you know, even the first time I went to Pakistan, which was in 2003, I think. Um, I mean, it is remarkable when you go there from Delhi because it was so much richer than India. Um, and obviously so many more consumer goods in the shops. Uh, it changed in 2009, I think, is when Indian GDP per capita rose above uh, Pakistani GDP per capita for the first time. Um and since then, that trend has continued. Um, I, I think it would be fair to say that Pakistan has been burnt um, and that it saw huge, huge blowback um, from the, the war in Afghanistan. It saw the rise of the, the Pakistani Taliban that then turned on the Pakistani state itself. Um, uh, was tremendous, you know, there were a whole spate of really terrible bomb attacks in Pakistan itself. Um, so I would say that while people might have a little bit of schadenfreude about India having its wings clipped in Afghanistan, I wouldn't say that. I'd be very surprised if the generals in in Rawalpindi are sitting there celebrating this. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not a it's not a hugely happy situation for Pakistan. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, they, they, their control over the Afghan Taliban depended on them being the only country that gave the Afghan Taliban sanctuary. Um, the Afghan Taliban don't need that anymore. So, um, you know, yeah, they'll maintain relations and there'll be old, um, old ties and old networks, but, um, you know, the Afghan Taliban don't trust the Pakistanis either, so they're not in a comfortable place at all. Um, I mean, I guess the, the one thing that's probably worth keeping in mind in terms of the economy is that as long as the top brass and the military and their allies can continue to get rich, then the question of GDP per capita is less significant than it seems. But Obviously, it's not entirely clear that they will be able to continue to get rich in a country that is um, becoming poorer. Uh, it's also not, I mean, it, it is, 
I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens to the US-Pakistan relationship now. Um, as you know, the US was horribly dependent on Pakistan during the war in Afghanistan because it, re it had to move its supply lines for Afghanistan through Pakistan. Um, that meant it could never, it got caught in, in a complete bind. It could never really turn on Pakistan um, to try and, or to try and force it to end its support for the Afghan Taliban, because then its supply lines would have been closed and it would have lost the war anyway. I think it's quite interesting to see what happens now that the US really isn't particularly dependent on, on Pakistan anymore. Um, they don't need those supply lines. And I just wonder if that will allow for a much needed cooling of the relationship. Um, that uh, There are so many variables at play that it's not clear, but, but I would have thought that there'll be huge resentment in the US administration, whatever they say publicly, um, against Pakistan. Um, there is also a sort of interesting bit that I, I'm i not sure we're entirely clear on, but those peace talks, whatever you think about the peace talks the Americans had with the Afghan Taliban, um, they do seem to have built their own uh, their own relationship with them which means that they will not be going through, they'll not be going with a begging bowl to Pakistani intelligence and asking Pakistani intelligence to introduce them to the guy that matters in the Afghan Taliban. They have their own, um, their own um, connections now. Um, so I would have thought, in, it, it, I, I, I don't think a cooling off period between the US and Pakistan is a bad thing by any means. Um, and the relationship had got too tangled and, and messy. So that then would lead you to think that Pakistan will become more and more dependent on China. Um, I, again, I have my doubts as to how that will play out. I mean, culturally, Pakistan is much more orientated towards the West. Uh, the, you know, the generals will send their kids to universities in America. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they don't have a, you, you don't have to see it. There's a lot of, you know, you don't see any depth of, 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 in, in, in terms of depth, in terms of the Pakistan, China relationship. Um, it's, 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 it's obviously very strong at the sort of strategic level. Um, but culturally Pakistan is not a natural fit with China by any means. Um, so, you know, whether, the generals can pull this off. I don't know. I I do not believe that they will want to be sucked into completely into the China camp. Um, I think they're actually going to want to try and keep um, keep some ties going with the U.S. Um, with Europe, obviously with Britain. That's that's inevitable. So what will be very interesting is to see how they pull it off, because what you're now going to have is an America cooling towards Pakistan and Pakistan kind of waking up and thinking, but wait a minute, if we don't kind of hang on to the West a little bit, we're going to get sucked completely into China, which is probably not not particularly what they want to do. Um, I don't know if that's been changing recently, but, you know, you, you would need to see real evidence, generals and everybody else sending their kids to to university in China. Um, there's a bit more of learning Chinese, um, but, you know, not not really across the board in any in any real way. Um, the even if you, you know, it's a while since I've been to Pakistan, but I mean, just even in a sort of popular culture sense, you'll hear people complaining about how shoddy Chinese goods are compared to Western goods. Uh, those little things that I think are actually going to be kind of, it would be worth in some ways drawing up a check sheet of those kind of things. That I see them more as a kind of very, very wary of getting too sucked in. Um, yeah. So uh, let me ask you a question um, in this, uh, you know, sense. I mean, I feel like uh, so India has a Hindu nationalist government under Modi. On the other hand, 
Um, I feel like there's a lot of Indian Americans in the United States and, you know, it's still a democracy. It's economically dynamic. It's cultural export is Bollywood. Uh, you know, a lot of Indians right now are um, expressing a lot of anger at the United States for the precipitous rapid pullout out of Pakistan. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems like uh, there are just kind of gravitational forces. Uh, well, push and pull. I think the push is, you know, the rise of China as a geopolitical, uh, you know, force in Asia and um, is pushing that together. But also they're, they're being pulled together in some ways, I think, by like aspects of kind of their cultural openness, uh, maybe their diversity. Um, Americans, I think Americans have a romantic view of Indian culture and going to ashrams and vegetarian food, whereas um, uh, they don't have as many positive associations, associations, to be frank, with Pakistan. Um, it's not it's not as big of a country, but you know Pakistan's mostly in the news, not in a positive way in the United States. So, um, like, what do you think about that assertion? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, um, the that kind of romantic view of India is obviously incorrect, uh, but it's it's it it perhaps does help. Also, by far the bigger, uh, well, I mean, two very big things about India, but I think the most important one is that. As long as it remains a growing economy um, with a huge, 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 you know, billion strong pool of consumers, then Americans and indeed all Western businesses are going to be interested in getting in there. And, you know, that's that's still a, in relative terms, it's not a mature market. I mean, it's it's a it's it's still one where people are sort of getting on the ladder in terms of, of consumer purchasing. So, I mean, the Indian economic pool will remain. Um, I, I don't know how people will view, you know, my feeling is that I do sort of think that the Indian dem democracy show will stay on the road. Uh, but, I mean, I realize that that's less, less certain now than it would have been a few years ago. Um, but it certainly feels to me, also, you know, it does feel to me like the sort of country that is so diverse and fractious and 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 voluble and with everybody having a different opinion I, I i don't see it becoming a completely authoritarian state so there will still be uh, as far as i can see a um a continuation of at least the electoral process in india and as long as that electoral process continues any government will be compelled to deliver economic growth for its people and as long as economic growth continues, then um, Western businesses, including American businesses, are going to be drawn to India. Um, the other side of it is obviously China. Um, that's a little bit more complicated because I, I you know, I, the U.S. clearly wants to build a relationship with India to counter China, but without necessarily taking on India's baggage about China. Um, India, as part of I've covered in my, my most recent book, has a long run running border uh, dispute with China. There is that goes back to 1962. Um, uh, India China war fought in 1962 at the same time as the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is how you remember the date. Um, and I don't see America wanting to get sucked into that uh, India-China border conflict either. So, I mean, it's, so in terms of, of, of strategy, um, there is some overlap of interest, but there is um, probably at a defense level a fair amount of wariness too. Um, and then the, the other point I think that uh, is worth making is that, I mean, in, in terms of the West um in as much as there is such a thing as the west uh us led west um the primary interest between in, in relations between india and pakistan is to stop a war because nobody wants a war that they're afraid could turn into a nuclear war so i mean ultimately people will always try to have a reasonably reasonable relations um or with both sides and try and and try and nudge people that nudge India and Pakistan, if not necessarily towards peace, because that's very ambitious, at least to keep lines of communication open. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of your work, uh, from what I can see, is, uh, you know, involved in these, uh, I don't know, the, the great game in the Himalayas at this point, like in Kashmir. Um, Kashmir, I, I want to ask, um, are you worried uh, that Pakistan will use its strategic alliance with the Taliban uh, to, um, you know, raise up a new generation of militants that they'll send to Kashmir. I mean, this is the kind of thing I'm hearing from Indians. And they talk, I mean, to be frank, they talk a lot about Kashmir and I just ignore it because I'm American and, you know, we don't, you know what I'm saying? We don't pay attention to stuff aside from Israel and like maybe what happened in Iraq. There's just not much we pay attention to. Um, I understand Indians are really focused on this issue. I don't really get it, but that's, again, I'm, I'm not there. Um, so do you think that that's a real worry, worry or do you think it's a paranoia? I mean, I'm just I'm trying to get your sense here. Well, it's a bit of both, I suppose. I mean, the, the origin of the paranoia is that, um, you know, the, the, the insurgency in Kashmir began in or really began in earnest in 1989, the year of the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. So clearly in the Indian mind, um, then you know, there is a very obvious link between Afghanistan and Kashmir. And certainly it's true that when uh, the Soviet Union withdrew, it's certainly true that Pakistan used Afghanistan to destabilize India and and encourage and fuel the Kashmir insurgency. Um, I should just mention just by by way of, for for people who might have forgotten this, but at the um, end of, in 1999, in something that was almost certainly orchestrated by Pakistan or by the Pakistani intelligence. Uh, there was a plane hijacked from Kathmandu in Nepal to Kandahar in Afghanistan, um, um, flown into Afghan control, into Taliban controlled Afghanistan um, with a, a plane load of Indian passengers. The Indian government was forced to hand over prisoners, um, including someone who'd been caught in Kashmir, um, a prominent um, prominent member of the anti-Kashmir militancy, um, was forced to hand those over um, because obviously uh, there was nothing else they could do in, in Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. So they've had, there's a lot of wounds and that paranoia is therefore understandable. Um, in that it's it's still very raw. I mean, if you imagine, uh, well, I guess in the same way as the um, uh, the American embassy thing um, is still raw, and in, in going back to the Iranian revolution, and that was seventy nine, and I don't think that America's ever really recovered from that. Uh, so you know, it's reasonable to be raw about an old wounds not to heal. Uh, all that said. Um, I'm not convinced that history will repeat itself um, for two reasons. First of all, China has no interest in seeing Pakistan encourage militancy um, and because China is going to be worried about the rise of Islamist militancy in Xinjiang, which is, just to remind everyone, also on the border of Kashmir. Uh, so it's I, I should think China will keep Pakistan under quite a strict reign um, to not let it build up the militancy to the peaks we saw ahead of 9-11. I should think America will keep Pakistan on quite tight reign if it can. It was a little bit lax in the 90s um, about letting this happen and not challenging it enough. I don't see it after 9-11 being as lax again. Um, and... Pakistan has been burnt itself. So, you know, I just, yeah, you'll see a little bit, but I don't, you're not going to see, I don't think, I mean, you can never say anything for certain in that part of the world, but I don't think you're going to see a rerun of what happened in 1989. I think it'll be much more low key. Um, and, you know, Pakistan faces far too many challenges now to start I don't think it can manage those things. It, it mm -hmm. you know, it's all historically. It is always trying to keep stuff on the India front quiet as long as Afghanistan was a problem. When Afghanistan isn't a problem, the Indian front kind of flares up. But 
I don't think Pakistan's got the Afghan thing under control at the moment, and I don't. I very much doubt believe believes that they think they have. So, you know, they're going to be taking their time to work out how Afghanistan settles anyway before they do anything. So, um, I mean, that's not a reason to say that India shouldn't be kind of trying to. I mean, but then I, I, I think this is always a standing requirement is that I think India and Pakistan need to talk to each other. I don't think they need to talk to each other in, in public, but I think they, they always need to keep some kind of line of communication open. Um, um, the other point I would make is, and it's, it's a little bit, probably a bit overcomplicated, but uh, to try and keep it simple. Um, so as you know, the erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir was split in two between India and Pakistan in 1947-48. The part that Pakistan has control over, um, so Gilgit Baltistan, is it's, it, its main land bridge to China. It is through Gilgit Baltistan that um, the Karakoram Highway runs. Um, it's through there that the Chinese-Pakistan economic corridor will run. So Pakistan has every interest in actually stabilizing and intensifying its control over Gilgit Baltistan. It, it is, it is put forward measures in Parliament just last month, which didn't get enough attention to actually make give Gilgit Baltistan full provincial status. So I mean, to try and make that simple, it, essentially what it's doing is the division of Pakistan. Sorry, the division of Jammu and Kashmir in 47-48 down what is now called the line of control is, is essentially being formalized. And Pakistan has an interest in formalizing it because it, it wants its side to be stably under control to allow it to maintain its land bridge with China. So it's not entirely clear to me that whatever they say in public and in terms of rhetoric and so on, it's not entirely clear to me that they want to kind of bring all that Jammu and Kashmir stuff back to the boil again, because they've always tried to keep the violence and the instability to the Indian side and, and essentially to the Kashmir Valley, which is um, the heartland of, of the former princely state. But, you know, once you start throwing, stirring the pot on that, you start then asking questions about the whole of the former princely state. And that's not, in Pakistan's interest, so that's a yeah, lot. Yeah. Sorry, that's yeah, a lot no. cover for if you if you don't follow it closely. I don't know if that's clear, but it's uh... no, no, no. It is. Uh, I I do have to say for the listeners, um, just uh, go check on Google Images the Karakoram Highway. Uh, uh, it's it's really really. Uh, as someone who lives in the Western United States, it's it's familiar. Um, in terms of the vistas, but it's like multi multiple fold up in the scale of the mountains and uh just the majesty of it all it's it's pretty incredible to me um and you know i mean i support economic development economic growth i, I wish the the pakistanis well uh, on that front and um you're right i mean it's not that far from the line of control i mean if that whole area blows up that's not good for pakistan uh you know it's got something it's got something to lose there um as we you know i want to i want to close up this conversation um so i, I do want to ask you uh, the precipitous American withdrawal, um, you know, people are saying, you know, they could have withdrawn, but it didn't need, didn't need to be happened this way and and all this stuff. I mean, what is your general um, general take uh, on that uh, line of objection? I mean, obviously, I don't think anyone thinks that it was great to withdraw like that. On the other hand, um, we've been saying that you know, from an American perspective, like, let's be frank, for like 10 years now, people have been saying, well, now is not the right time to withdraw. And so it's been 10 years. I think a lot of Americans just feel like it's never going to be the right time to withdraw. So, you know, this is just what's going to happen. But anyway, I mean, what, what is your take on that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely mine. I mean, I think it was, a, I mean, it, it is a judgment call to say whether um, now was the right time to withdraw or not. I'm, uh, I, I'm slightly flabbergasted by people who think that that there were any good options. I mean, staying on would have been a bad option as well. Um, and it, it wasn't a stable situation. You could have kept maybe 3,000 American troops in Afghanistan. The Taliban would have kept, um, would have continued to increase in strength and um, 
the only way the American troops would then hold them at bay is through airstrikes, um, and those airstrikes kill Afghan civilians, thereby making uh, foreign troops even more unpopular. So the notion that America could have stayed and um, and that it would have remained stable is, is definitely wrong. Uh, I, I guess I think you can still say it's a judgment call, um, but I had a lot of sympathy for, for President Biden when he said he wasn't going to send any more troops or put any more troops in harm's way um, um, for a war that's essentially unwinnable. And I mean, this seems to me obvious is that a president or a prime minister ultimately is responsible to their own citizens and if you've come down to the point where it's a very narrowly balanced judgment call on whether you should be having troops put at risk then you probably aren't really justified in putting them at risk um so i i kind of think on balance we'll have to see but i think on balance he's done the right thing um as for the manner of withdrawal well i i you know i'm Yes, it could have been done very differently, but I must say, I I wonder whether I'm just getting old and cynical here, but, you know, I've never seen a war that ends nicely. Um, you know, I just, you know, you either end up with the most horrible, brutal fighting and savagery with lots of civilians killed. Um, you know, it there, there seems, and, and I think perhaps because I have written about wars, because I, I you know, my first book was on the Siachen War between India and Pakistan, I find some of the commentary a little bit kind of um, idealistic. Is that the word? I mean, it's like, what what do you think happens when wars end? It's horrible, and, and it's not the war is not ending in Afghanistan, I'm, presumably, but the U.S. war in Afghanistan is ending. Is that look, this is a mess. But where does this, this idea come from that you can end a war with it not being in a mess? I mean, it's it's as as messes go. This is not that terrible um it's not you know shelling of kabul it's it's um yeah in an ideal world yes they should have got their act together to get everybody out sooner to have a smoother evacuation plan um but you know you're, you're running it's it almost the idea that this war should have been ended cleanly is almost speaks to the reason why america should not be in afghanistan in the first place you do not pull off a clean operation ending a war in a country like Afghanistan like that and every, everything goes swimmingly and beautifully. Mm. So, um, you know, you're not running a logistics operation in Austin. So mm. um, I, um, I, I, I don't know how it will play with the American domestic public, but certainly I look at it and I think, you know, and look at some of the reactions and I do sort of think that grow up, guys. It's like there's an awful lot of horrible things happen and wars end horribly. And pretending that that is not the case is is sort of is very naive yeah i mean I, you know my own opinion um you know seeing american adventures over the last generation is i think america wants wants to have it both ways in terms of basically having an empire but not taking the responsibility putting skin in its game and also just imposing order like an empire would um, you know, we go into Afghanistan and we create a, uh, you know, presidential liberal democratic system. Um, the Afghan embassy is promoting uh, LGBTQIA rights. Uh, we're excited that there's gender studies at the University of Kabul. Um, this none of this was organic. Uh, this was a, a demand for cultural change from the United States. Uh, but, you know, we're just the ally. You know, we're not forcing people to do things. I think there's just a fundamental disconnect there. Uh, between the fact that um, we do have imperial ambitions, but, you know, we're not going to do what the older colonial regimes did, which is, you know, get our hands dirty and frankly be unpleasant and impressive in some ways if that's what you want to do. Um, I think, you know, we we just want to be loved and yet also be like the Roman Empire or something. I don't know. It's just it seems like we're, we, we don't acknowledge it as a society, um, our, our dual intents here. Yeah, and also I think, well, there's, yeah, and I mean, two things. There's one, if you were going to build an empire, you wouldn't do it in Afghanistan. I mean, the, the, you, the British didn't try and do it in Afghanistan. You do it in places where you've got, as I said earlier, urban elites that you can co-opt um, and have them collaborate with you. Um, and then, you know, and then you do it um, 
piecemeal over years. I I am. Um, I also say America has a bit of a a blind spot about um, the British Empire, and the uh, you know, and I do not defend the British Empire. I'm not going to apologise for it, but I think there are some lessons that can be learned on things that Britain did get right, and America has such a sort of blanket, you know, knee jerk and obviously historical dislike of the British Empire um, that. It, it rarely looks at some of those. And I was just, you know, thinking in terms of what went wrong with Afghanistan. Um, I mean, after the early decades or the early years even of British rule in India, it, it didn't do too badly at getting rid of corruption. Um, I mean, there were all sorts of self-interested reasons for that. But, but I mean, I think it is, it is worth looking at and thinking, well, how did Britain manage to set up a relatively non-corrupt um system of government whereas america goes in and it set up the most corrupt system of government imaginable in afghanistan which contributed to its defeat so you know you, you can look at some of the stuff the british got right without 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 thinking well yeah we, then you're suddenly cheering for empire but you're actually looking at how do you get these things to work but i would still say i don't think if you were going to do it afghanistan is the place to do it because uh it, it not because of anything intrinsically wrong with Afghans, but it, that, that whole state had been so hollowed out by years and years of war um, that mm -hmm. you didn't have a you didn't have anything that you could get purchase on and build on. Whereas you know Britain Britain basically built on the existing and uh, you might say leached off, but um, uh, the existing structure that was already in place in India when it first came in. So it's very different anyway. Um, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but it, certainly one of my personal personal kind of beefs is I think that Americans should probably try and it won't make America imperialist, but if, if simply actually trying to learn from some of the stuff that Britain did, even if they... Um, uh, yeah. good, good luck with that advice on America learning from history and learning from others, you know, because... Uh... You know, we're a can-do nation that can just do everything by ourselves. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and well done to America for its optimism, but I guess, um, I guess America has achieved a lot with its optimism as well. So um, uh, maybe it just needs to hold on to its optimism, but not try and go into sort of deeply complicated places like Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's how a lot of us are feeling. Um, so, uh, Myra, uh, it's great, uh, you know, giving you your insights and talking to you. I really appreciate it. I've look forward to talking to you for many years. Uh, really appreciate your social media presence. I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are just emoting and they're using social media to to gain clout, and I, I don't see you doing that. So, uh, you're definitely one of the good ones, and I really um, commend your your presence out there. And everyone should follow you. Uh, thank you for. Uh, for talking to us and um you know your books uh white as the shroud as the shroud and uh, uh defeat as an orphan people should check that out and um you know let's hope that things get better than they are right now okay well thank you and nice to talk to you yeah this podcast for kids